Welcome to the world of material science. My name is Professor Bonnet. In this video, we will talk about tempering and quenching, thus bringing the topic of the last two teaching videos to a close, before we will finally deal with processes for surface hardening and thermomechanical diffusion treatment. We have already talked about two of the three important steps in hardening on several occasions. We already know that hardening begins with austenizing, which is heating and holding at austenizing temperature. This is followed by quenching at the supercritical cooling speed. This is usually followed by tempering. We already know that the achievable hardness depends on the carbon content and that alloying elements reduce the critical cooling rate, or their content determines the quenching agent. After quenching, however, carbon atoms can diffuse to more favorable interstitial lattice sites by tempering, thus heating to low temperatures in the range of 180 to 250 degrees Celsius leads to an insig insignificant decrease in hardness, but a significant increase in toughness. Tempering is sufficient to give the quenched components, which are initially glass-hard and also brittle as glass, the necessary toughness so that they do not break by simply being struck. Yield strengths, tensile strengths and correspondingly the hardness are only slightly reduced by this heat treatment. A significant increase in toughness can only be observed at temperatures above 400 degrees Celsius. Hardening and tempering is understood to be hardening with subsequent tempering at correspondingly higher temperatures between 400 and 650 degrees Celsius. Hardness and tensile strengths are lower than those of hardened steel, but are still significantly higher than those of untreated material. Compared to the hardened material, ductility and toughness increase significantly. During hardening and tempering, cementite grains are precipitated from the hardened structure, which can be detected metallographically at higher temperatures. Thus, tempering produces property profiles that lie between the normalized and hardened states. The characteristic curve of the hardened and tempered steel can be changed by the tempering temperature. The hardening and tempering diagram shown on the left for the hardened and tempered steel C45 and the hardening and tempering diagram shown on the right for the hardened and tempered steel 42 CRM04 show how the mechanical properties change when these hardened steels are tempered to temperatures between 400 and 650 degrees Celsius. At 400 degrees Celsius, the tensile strengths Rm and yield strengths Re are higher, but the elongation at break, A5.65, is lower than in the upper temperature range if this is selected. These stress strain diagrams clearly illustrate once again the different mechanical behavior of steel in the various heat treatment states. The hardened steel exhibits maximum strength with minimum toughness. The normalized steel allows maximum formability at low strength levels. Compared to the normalized state, the hardened and tempered steel shows significantly increased strength characteristics with constant toughness, expressed by the deformation work corresponding to the area under the stress strain curve. But let us now come to the end of this section on heat treatment of steel to the exciting topic of surface hardening. For many components in mechanical engineering, one wants a high wear resistance and thus hardness on the surface, but at the same time a tough core. These components include shafts, gear wheels and machine beds. Various hardening processes are used for this purpose. We have already learned about one method in the videos on time temperature transition diagrams, or more specific 
as we talked about the Jomini test. During this test, the complete workpiece is heated to the austenizing temperature with subsequent quenching. We have learned that in the case of unalloyed steel, only a thin surface layer is hardened. However, the technical significance of this process is, is low. Much more frequently, surface hardening is done by heating a layer close to the surface to the austenizing temperature with subsequent quenching. The change in the material condition of the surface layer is achieved without changing the chemical composition of the steel. Flame hardening and induction hardening have the greatest technical significance. The rapid heating of the surface is achieved during flame hardening with gas burners. Since the heat should not be distributed in the component, it is quenched with a water spray immediately after heating. The thickness of the hardened layer can be adjusted via the burner capacity. The process is usually carried out with the simple of means, but sometimes also fully mechanically. It can be used for large components for which other hardening methods are technically not reasonable or economically justifiable. In induction hardening, the workpiece surface is heated by means of an induction coil and high frequency. The induced eddy currents, which are forced into the outer layers of the workpiece by the skin effect. Their areas heat up very quickly through resistance heating. The heat is not transferred to the workpiece from outside, as in flame hardening, but is generated inside the workpiece. Therefore, very high heating speeds can be achieved. The short heating time reduces the risk of warping and cracking. The risk of coarse grain formation is also low. The process is easy to automate and the timing of the hardening process can be easily controlled. However, due to the high plant and induction costs, it can generally only be used economically for large quantities. The processes for surface hardening with thermochemical diffusion treatment are divided into processes without and with subsequent heat treatment. The processes with subsequent heat treatment include carburizing, carbonitriding, boriding and chromizing. Here I would like to use an example of the process of case hardening by carburizing. The processes for surface hardening with thermochemical diffusion treatment without subsequent heat treatment include sulfidizing, oxidizing, nitriding, nitrocarburizing and GKZ annealing. I would like to use nitriding as an example of these processes. In the process of case hardening, carbon in atomic form is introduced into the surface of workpieces made of low carbon steel containing 0 to 0.2 percent carbon, which are therefore not hardenable from the outside by diffusion. The temperature at which the carbon diffusion takes place must be chosen high enough to avoid the formation of brittle cementite on the one hand and to allow the carbon content required for hardening to be dissolved in the steel on the other. The steel must therefore be austenitized, thus annealed in the gamma region. A eutectic composition with a carbon content of 0.8% is aimed for in the hardening zone in order to prevent brittleness and cracking sensitivity caused by too much cementite. Solid, liquid and gaseous carburizing agents are used for carburizing. Examples are coal as a solid carburizing agent, cyanide salts as a liquid carburizing agent and messine as a gaseous carburizing agent. The carburizing depth is the distance vertically from the surface to the core to a point with 0.3% carbon content and depends on temperature and time. After carburizing, the workpiece is quenched 
and tempered. Gears are classic examples of case hardening applications. Gears are constantly exposed to high loads and therefore require extremely hard and wear resistant surfaces with a tough core. We can see that case hardening has taken place on this gear with an outer diameter of 550 mm. The case hardening depth of a good 1.8 mm was determined with the help of the hardness curve shown. According to Dean E. N. ISO uh, 2639, the case hardening depth is defined as the vertical distance from the surface to the layer with a Vickers hardness of 550 HV1. This is also referred to as the limit hardness. In computer control systems, it is possible to set hardening depths from 0.4 mm to 5 mm during case hardening. A component weight of 6000 kg and component dimensions of diameters up to uh, 1.2 meters, as shown here, can be realized without any problems, so that even such gears with a unit weight of up to 2000 kg are no problem. The increase in hardness during nitriding is not due to martensite formation. In this process, nitrogen diffuses automatically into the workpiece surface. The formation of iron nitrides is undesirable here, as they are very coarse, needled and insufficiently hard. For this reason, nitriding steel is alloyed with aluminum, chromium, titanium and molybdenum all of which form very hard submicroscopic special nitrides, which in finely distributed form results in high and very uniform hardness values and relatively large hardness depths. In nitriding, the workpiece is heated in ammonia, NH3, at 500 to 600 degrees Celsius for about 30 to 60 hours. Cooling can take place in the furnace since the hardness is not produced by lattice bracing but by nitride formation. The hardness is therefore also resistant up to approximately 500 degrees Celsius. During nitriding the workpiece hardly warps at all since it is not quenched. As always, I thank you for your attention and I look forward to seeing you again at the next video.